Dr. Kritika, may start, please. Yes, sir. Good evening, respected faculties and my dear colleagues. A warm welcome to each and every one of you on today's ISA National PG class on the topic anesthetic management of a case of pituitary macroadenoma in a patient undergoing this surgery with, macro, with acromegaly. But um, as uh, the ISA, these classes, they are being held every Monday evening at 6.30 p.m. And it's our customary that we begin this class by evoking the blessings of our Ma uh, Saraswati with the Saraswati Vanda. So here we go. Now, I would like to request our uh, uh, ISA Honorary Secretary, Sir, Dr. Sukhminda Jeet Singh Bajwa. He is the Professor and Head of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Department in Gyan Sagar Medical College and Hospital, Patiala, Punjab. Sir, please kindly say a few words on your. Thank you, Dr. Kritika. Uh, today, it's a very important topic and close to my heart also, the endocrine surgery and that to patient with a with acromegaly and with the, none other than better teacher than Dr. Ajit Bhardwaj and Dr. Shamik Paul and their third year resident Dr. Surbi going to present. With, we are now encountering, I think, three specialties in these type of surgeries. The ENT specialist waking away from endoscopically to the brain, then the neurosurgeon is also has to stand by, then the third person is, uh, you know, the endocrinologist. And the most important is the anesthesiologist. We should not forget the fourth person. The fourth is the most important because these type of surgeries, they are very challenging. So many comorbidities with so many anesthetic challenges, the drug interactions, as well as the perioperative complications, who can take care of best of the patient rather than the anesthesiologist. So I think this class is going to be a wonderful class. And now I, I think without wasting time, we should start the proceeding. So Dr. Pratika, back to you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. Now I request my colleague, Dr. Anupma, Anupma Reddy, to proceed with this session and introduce our faculties. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kritigan. Uh, now I, I here welcome the moderators for today's session. With first moderator is Dr. Shamik Kher Paul. Sir is a professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pitagory at Ram Kusum Medical College, Pune. Sir is basically a neuroanesthesiologist and he is also trained in pain and palliative care. He is an instructor for acute critical care courses and he is also an instructor for ETLS, ACLS and acute neuro care. And he is a life member of ISA, SNAC, IC, ISACM, IOA and EMS. Sir is also Secretary of Defense, uh, Society of Defense Anesthesiologists and Co-Secretary of SNAC 2024. He is also a governing uh, Council member of ISNAC. Um, major achievements for him are uh, inventor of Raksha Kavach with aerosol retractive canopy. He has the funny patent and he is also an inventor of NIV mask for PD with also the patent. And Sir has the honorary awards in the military awards like GOC in Sikh condemnation card in year 2008, 2015, 2016, and CDS. Commendation card 2021 and BGA FMS appreciation card 
2021 and other uh, he has multiple other state and national awards and sir has many national and international publications and sir has two chapters in the book sir critical uh, areas of interest are trauma neurotrauma innovation geriatrics pain pain medicine and palliative care i welcome you sir for today's um session thank you ma'am thank you so much and the next uh, second moderator is Dr. Ajit Bharadwaj, sir, who is also a professor in anesthesiology at AFMC um, Pune. I welcome you, sir, today. A warm mm -hmm. welcome to the, both the moderators, and I would like you to uh, take over the session. Uh, and today's uh, instructions are like, I would request all the audience to mute during the process of the session, and I also request all the... Uh, students especially to um of the videos and if there are any queries i request them to add it in the screenshot uh, okay, in the say session and now i would uh, request the moderators to continue the session take the session forward thank you uh thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you uh sir, for this uh, opportunity to moderate this very important topic we are with us uh, uh major surbi she is a uh, third year resident of anesthesiology here and extremely good resident, very sincere, hardworking. And she has been assisting, you know, she has been a part of such uh, uh, pituitary surgeries, uh, quite a few of them in the past. Uh, so, Surbi, will you like to start off with your uh, with the case today? First of yes, all, sir. give us a big smile. Yeah, chill out. Yeah, come on. Start off with the case. That's great. Can you uh, share the screen and yes, sir. The... yeah, great. Sir, I hope the slides are visible. Yeah, they are visible. Great. Good evening, everyone. We start with the case presentation of a 39-year-old male, a serving soldier, hailing from Andhra Pradesh, graduate, informant is self with good reliability, who presented to us with widening of hands and feet since two years. The symptoms were insidious in onset, progressive and painless. Patient complained of increase in shoe size from 9 to 10.5, along with tightening of the wedding ring and increase in the size of the tongue, leading to accidental tongue bites while chewing. Along with this and further history, he also gave complaints of heaviness in the head since two years, which was on the front of the head, equal on both sides, intermittent, relieved with rest, not requiring any medication, with no diurnal or partial variation with no specific aggravating factors. Patient also gave history of change in voice and heaviness of voice since the last two years. Patient did not give any history of headache, any aura ringing in ears, any nasal discharge, facial flushing, photophobia, phonophobia, or vomiting. There is no history of weakness, stiffness of limbs, wasting of muscles, unsteadiness of gait, incoordination in dark or involuntary movement. There is no history of tingling, numbness, root pain, decrease in hot or cold sensation on the skin, decrease of feeling the ground while walking, decrease in feeling the clothes on the skin. There is no history of difficulty in initiating of micturation, hesitancy or incontinence. There are no bowel disturbances. There is no history of any sexual dysfunction, any disturbances in smell. There is no history of any reduced near vision, inability to differentiate between colors, double vision or deviation of eyeball. There is no history of tingling or numbness over the face. There is no history of asymmetry of mouth, dribbling of saliva or difficulty in drinking water. There is no history of vertigo, ringing sensation in the ears or reduced hearing. No history of nasal twang or shrugging of shoulders. No history of difficulty in talking, swallowing or nasal regurgitation of food. There is no history of restlessness or any personality changes as per the wife of the patient. No history of involuntary movements. No history of any ear discharge recent or remote head injury, no history of blackouts, unconsciousness or dizziness, no history of fever or chest pain. Past history, there is no history of similar episodes in the past. 
there is no history suggestive of diabetes, hypertension, tuberculosis, or bronchial asthma. Patient has had no past hospital stay, ICU stay, or surgeries. Patient is not on any medications. Personal history, patient consumes a normal mixed diet. He has normal appetite, regular bowel habits, denies any consumption of alcohol, smoking, or drugs of abuse. Uh, there is a history of increase in weight from 77 kg to, the, to 85 kg in the last two years. Patient complains of sleep disturbances due to frequent awakening at night, daytime sleepiness, and feeling of tired, tiredness in the morning with a stop band score of 4 by 8 with snoring, tiredness, obstructive sleep episodes, and gender being positive. In view of daytime sleepiness, Epsworth sleepiness scale was calculated, which was 12 out of 24, which is suggestive of excessive daytime sleepiness. Patient has good function capacity with metabolic equivalence of task score of more than 8. There is no significant family history. And this is the end of the history. To summarize so, Survi, his yeah, so Survi, the thing is that, uh, uh, can you go back to the uh, negative history? Can you just go back yes, to the sir. slides? Yeah. So uh, I guess you have summarized everything that is to be there for a negative history for a neurological patient, a neurosurgical sir. patient. So if you come to a headache, did the patient have headache? This patient did not have headache, sir. Okay. <clears throat> but uh... if there's a headache of a patient with a neuro neurosurgical condition or neurological condition, neurosurgical condition primarily. So, what is the type of headache the patient has, and how is the progression of the headache? Can you just uh, give us a small uh, enlightenment? Sir, uh, in uh, neurosurgical cases, patient's headache uh, will uh, be more in the mornings. And yes. uh, why so? Uh, Okay, so in the night, you know, this but, patient is not 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 breathing properly, and in in fact, all of us do have some retention of carbon dioxide in the night, and if sir. there is uh, the carbon dioxide can, uh, the PCO two increases, there is increase in cerebral blood flow, so in sir. the night, the ICP might increase, right? You in know, patient who has sir. got a tumor, so some sort of uh, there is a discontinence between the vasoconstriction, vasodilatation, uh, what sir. we call as autoregulation. So there can be headache in the morning with vomiting and all. So this thing does have a connotation. But if there is headache, you need to differentiate headache from other neurosurgical condition and neurological condition like migraine. So excellent, there is no headache. <clears throat> and uh, what else positive history was there? Can you just uh, think tell us about the positive history? So there was widening of hands and feet and heaviness yes, yes, of yes, head. Yes, yes. Yeah, so be now since we are just changing some headache to different topic, I would like to ask you one thing. Like you had said headache because of raised ICP because of morning. What is the reason of headache in a case of pituitary tumor? What can be the reason apart from raised ICP? So the mass effect. Yeah, so you need to go back to the anatomy of the pituitary. So uh, what all important structures are around. situated around it so you can correlate with that or there is involvement of any nerves which are related to it? Sir, uh, <clears throat> uh, pituitary stalk is in, uh, we have the optic chiasma nearby and uh, also we have uh, the cavernous sinus uh, yeah, so surrounding. What's, so, yeah, so headache can be because of involvement of ophthalmic and maxillary branches which are the sinus, yes, so sir. pressure effects. Or it can be invasion of cella, as you said, or in involvement of dura mater. So, yes. headache per se is a very common finding in a case of pituitary tumor in which you, in your case, it's not there. But otherwise, it's yes, a very sir. common finding. And in fact, pituitary tumors are very common in having this uh, vision loss. Yeah. So, yeah. in your case, there was no vision loss. It's, a, it's I, I guess, very early in the life of the tumor, it has been caught. Otherwise, the patient will come with a uh, visual impairment, uh, mostly in the bitemporal region because of the yes. compression of the chiasma. So great. So patient has got heaviness of voice. Patient has got hoarseness of voice, I guess. Yeah. Why heaviness of voice? Any idea? The patient okay, so has we'll had changed. We'll, we'll go about it a little later on. Now with the history you have just told, can you summarize the history and can you, can you actually in a... Uh, uh, Algorithmic find have a little more uh, objectivity in your history taking. Yeah. So, 
So the to summarize, thirty nine year old serving soldier presented with widening of hands and feet for two years, and associated with heaviness of head, weight gain, heaviness of voice, with a uh, stop bank score highly suggestive of OSA. History is suggestive of acromegalic features, secondary to pituitary tumor or cellar or supracellar tumor. Okay, so uh, patient is basically acromegalic, right? But patient does not have involvement of the vision, no headache, no cardiac impairment. Such good meds no, he has sir. got. No, such yes, good sir. meds he has got. So, and he's got no other family history. So, why family history are you talking about? What are you talking about? Why family history? Sir, pituitary tumor. Is... Yeah. Uh, so pituitary tumors can be associated with men syndrome, men yeah. one or men two. Men one and men four, so, yeah, mostly. And uh, so the syndromic uh, association is important to uh, for that we need to do the family history whether there has been any similar uh, complaints in the family as well. Okay, so great. So we now know that uh, there is something intracranial. And uh, they can be, and so now we'll get more objectivity by doing the examination. So can you go ahead with your examination, please? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Coming to the general physical examination, yes. my patient was comfortably sitting on the bed and he understands both, both Hindi and English. The procedure of examination was explained to the patient. On examination, the patient is well built and nourished with a height of 180 centimeter, weight of 89 kg and a BMI of 27.46 kg per meter square. Patient is well oriented to time, place, and person, conscious and cooperative. Uh, there is no, on examination, there is no pallor, ictus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or any pedial edema. Uh, patient's vitals uh, are, he has a pulse rate of 78 per minute, regular in rhythm, normal character, normal volume, with no blood vessel thickening, and peripheral pulsations are felt. He has a blood pressure of 130 by 80 millimeters of mercury in the right arm sitting position. He has a respiratory rate of 16 per minute, abdominal thoracic pattern. He is afebrile at the time of examination and his SpO2 uh, via pulse oximeter is 96% at room air. Modified Allen's test was negative in this case. A patient has a good venous axis. A uh, patient also has acanthosis present uh, which uh, of grade 2. And patient has a breath holding time of 55 seconds. Okay, so patient generally is... Can you just go back here? So, uh, why did you do a modified Allen's test in this patient? Uh, so, patients who have acromegalic features uh, will also have associated carpal tunnel syndrome. So, uh, have, they yeah. can be... Yes. They Likelihood can be, is more, yeah. Sir, so, they can be compression of the uh, uh, radial artery. So, that's why I would like to do a modified Allen's test to ensure that if this patient, when this patient goes for surgery and I have to go for invasive monitoring, uh, should I be cannulating uh, the artery or which hand not? Okay, so uh, anything significant you have found in the uh, general physical examination which you feel that you should uh, you should emphasize on? Uh, the patient has had is overweight uh, on examination and uh, has acanthosis. But his BMI uh, is 27.46, right? So yeah. BMI is already... He's just overweight, yes, sir. Okay. Nothing else, sir. Okay, so there's nothing else that is... Uh, okay. Now, can you go to the next slide, please? So coming to airway examination, patient has an inter incisor distance of more than 3 cm. Acromegalic facies, which I will uh, further uh, talk about. Patient has macroglossia, neck movement of uh, grade A. Sternomental distance of more than 12.5 cm, hyromental distance of more than 6.5 cm, neck circumference of 40 cm, upper lip bite test class 2, modified malampati classification 2, and with firm dentition. This is the area assessment of the patient, sir. So, are you anticipating a difficult intubation? Sir, even though a uh, patient has adequate mouth opening and uh, malampati classification is also good. Uh, acromegalic patients tend to have uh, soft tissue edema and uh, we can uh, find difficulty in the large epiglottis when we uh, do yeah. laryngoscopy. Yeah. So, I am anticipating. Yeah, so Malampati classification may not exactly uh, tell about, I mean, difficulty level of intubation in case of acromegaly. So, at times you may have an unanticipated 
difficult intubation. Difficult. Lot of times in cases of acromegaly, it can happen. And secondly, patient has a history of OSA. History yeah. of OSA yeah. always correlates with the difficulty of intubation. Okay, because yeah. there's maybe such a amount of soft tissue that is obstructing the patient. The patient is having OSA sleeping upright, right? And uh, you will anticipate a difficult anyway. Okay. Yeah. Next. Uh, sir, uh, coming up to the faces and habitus of the patient, uh, I would like to uh, mention here that these are representative pictures as I'm not allowed to show any identifying features of my patient. Uh, this is representative pictures taken from the internet which are, have the similar features as my patient. The patient has a frontal bossing with a prominent supraorbital ridge, prominent zygoma, a large nose, prognathism, thick lips, wide interdental spaces, spade like hands, velvety skin, broad feet, and tongue and auditory hyperpigmentation. So this is a general physical examination. Coming to the systemic examination, my patient is right-handed. He has a, a higher men on higher mental function examination, his speech, uh, his, uh, he's conscious, cooperative, well-kept, oriented to time, place, and person with uh, no memory impairment and uh, no uh, hallucinations or delusion. His speech is normal volume, rhythm, and has normal clarity and fluency. A mini mental state examination was done for this patient, and he had a, in which we uh, checked for orientation, registration, attention, calculation, recall, and language. And patient score, uh, scored a score of 30 by 30. Well, that is very great because I think if you do a MMSC for me also, I think well, I won't be scoring 30 because it's it is not so easy to do. Write on yourself. But okay, yeah. So uh, what is the education of the, of the patient? Sir, he's a graduate. He's done BA. So why does have education any, uh, you know, any correlation with MMSC? Uh, yes, sir. If the patient has a well educated, it's easier to do MSc, and we can correlate. If the patient's literacy is not so good, then we cannot correlate it with uh, MSc findings. So, if the patient so, is a graduate, what is the minimum amount of MS, MMSc should be having? Suppose patient is a uh, tenth pass. So, what should be the MMSc? Uh, when you, below which you say that it is abnormal, it cannot be twenty five, twenty six because he cannot understand your questions. Maybe a uh, not a matriculate. So less than twenty. Twenty, right? Twenty and twenty-four are uh, you, can, you can remember, but uh, the audience should always remember that MMSC is one thing that should be a part of all neurological examinations for all neuro, neuro, neurosurgical patients. It is an integral part of CNS examination, and you should always know about MMSC and how it is done. It is very simple. If you do it once, then you can uh, redo it n number of times. So please no, note MMSC and don't forget to do MMSC every time you get a patient for a neurosurgical patient for your examination. Okay, please go ahead. So coming to cranial nerve examination. <clears throat> uh, the cranial nerve examination was explained to the patient. Examination is done. And uh, we found that the first cranial nerve, there is no, smell is absolutely normal, no abnormality. In the second cranial nerve, optic nerve, the visual acuity is normal. Near vision is normal. Uh, patient is able to differentiate between colors. And the visual field by confrontation test was also normal. Uh, next, coming to the third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve examination, the extraocular movements were full and normal. Pupils are bilaterally central, 3 mm in size, and equally reactive to light with no tosis. Uh, coming to a fifth cranial nerve examination, the sensory over the face, over the dermatomes of the face, uh, was uh, had so, no abnormality. So sorry to interrupt you. Your, your cranial nerve examination, everything is okay. Yes, sir. So, just can you tell me, uh, is there any condition in which any of these nerves can be involved, which presents acutely? Uh, sir, if the patient has, your case? Uh, so the patient acutely. has uh, optic chiasma involvement, then he can have uh, uh, visual field effects. Yes, and apart from that, and if there is a, a extension to the cavernous sinus, sir. Yeah, then... so pituitary apoplexy can present as fixed dilated pupil also. Okay. Yes, so sir. what is the condition for the cavernous sinus? Since you have been harping on, I think you are guiding me. That should I, I ask, should ask you this question? So uh, yeah, that that's a very good tip for uh, the examiners or the examiners out there is that you can also guide your examiner. So I think, sir, we should talk about the contents of cavernous sinus now. 
Uh, so the cavernous sinus has the internal carotid artery, and uh, it has the uh, cranial nerves uh, third, fourth, sixth, and the V uh, one and V two uh, branches of the uh, trigeminal nerve. Okay, so excellent. So as Kalaji just mentioned about the problems that might happen, a patient might patient might present with pituitary apoplexy. There can be stock effect. There can be compression of all the uh, concerned uh, nerves. Okay, the one thing in your history was very important. That was uh, hoarseness of voice, right? Patient had change of voice. So what yes, that sir. can that be? Any nerve that can be affected? Sir, uh, the uh, patient was complaining of heaviness of voice, but on evaluation of the vagus nerve, there was uh, no abnormality. Okay. So, so uh, uh, this has got a medical legal connotation, right? You should always yes, uh, think that the two things, you know, like Fusual field effect, anosmia. Anosmia has to be ruled out because anosmia is also a complication of pituitary surgery. Yes, sir. And third is your recurrent laryngeal nerve involvement that may be there during the process of progression of the disease of acromegaly. Sir. So your patient probably has got some recurrent laryngeal nerve defect, though you have said that uh, on examination he does not have any defect, but that has to be documented. Okay. Sir. Good. <laughs> also, nothing significant in your uh, finding. Why do you think your your cranial nerve involvements are not there? Your uh, examination, physical examination, also all right. Why do you think that a pituitary tumor is not causing anything right now? Any, I like, are you getting some objectivity into your uh, examination from the progression of the disease till now? What are you expecting this to be? Sir. Uh, it could be because firstly, maybe he has presented early and the yes, disease has not progressed. Good. Three of two and years, one or two years. Two years. years. No, this is very lucky. He is very lucky because uh, generally these patients present very patient, patient late. But he had a functional tumor. Yes, he had sir. a functional tumor. That's why he has presented early. Had he had a non-functional tumor, all the he pressure effect would have made him present late. Okay, so functional yes, tumor generally patient presents early. Okay. So it's a functional. Now you know it's a functional tumor, right? Okay. Now please go ahead with your. So as long as you as you as you are going ahead in the path of examination, your mind should be also working towards differential diagnosis and diagnosis. Okay. So keep your mind open to all the information you are getting. Just don't go ahead with your uh, clinical uh, you know examination without and discordant. It should be all integrated. So you keep your mind open. Okay. Now after clinical loves what? So coming to motor system examination. Any, anything okay. abnormal in motor system? No, sir. No. No abnormality, okay. sir. No abnormality. So you have done your disc diagnosis, say, ruling out your cerebral signs. Yes. Uh, rhombus? Rhombus is a cerebral sign? Uh, no, sir. Uh, rhombus test is in uh, evaluation of the posterior column. Posterior column. Very good. So we should all examine this. We should know exactly what we are doing. And in this patient, we have no finding. As far as the motor system and the cerebral sense of touch. And what about sensory? The sensory also, there is no involvement, no uh, deficits, and uh, reflexes are also normal, sir. Okay. So there great. are no so involuntary movements. Everything is normal, right? Mm -hmm. Because the uh, functional tumor, it is not pro producing any uh, intracranial uh, hypertension, not producing any, and it is deteriorated very, very early. Whatever happening is happening because of some secretion of some hormones within the tumor. So it's a functional tumor. So okay. basically, the diagnosis is very clear yeah. because of the kind of presentation, acromegalic features, and also. Yeah. So now we are getting our, you know, uh, uh, focus right that it is probably something that is happening in the uh, brain, something probably pituitary, and something that is causing a functional, uh, you know, secretion of hormones causing. Some problems. So let's go ahead. Yeah. Next, next, go to the systems. There's other system examination, respiratory system. The upper air was normal. There was no nasal polyp or deviated nasal septum. And oral cavity also, there is no tonsillar swelling. Trachea is central. Uh, bilateral chest movements are normal and equal. And uh, there are bilateral vesicles, breath sounds heard, no adventitious sounds. On cardiovascular system examination, apex beat is not displaced. S1, S2 is heard. No murmurs or any carotid brewery. 
uh, an abdominal examination the umbilicus is central and inverted all quadrants are moving equally with respiration there is no tenderness no palpable mass or any organomegaly no free fluid in the abdomen on examination and bowel sounds are present okay now since we have gone for the other systemic examinations so a patient of acromegaly what systems are involved and how is it involved can you just give us a brief so that everybody can just revise acromegaly in just 5 minutes systemic features in short in very short very short systemic features right from uh, uh, sir yeah uh, sir a patient with acromegaly can have a respiratory uh, in, because of obstruct, obstructive sleep apnea can have yes. uh, breathing difficulties dyspnea and uh, lower saturation then uh, a cardiovascular involvement uh, can be presented can present in the form of uh, arrhythmias hypertrophy and uh, 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 the abdominal uh, no, patient in, can in also cardiovascular there's there is more you know there can be valvular heart defects yes sir okay there can be valvular heart defects and there can be patient can present in failure sir. valvular heart defects are the only defects that does not reverse after the pituitary surgery Yes, rest sir. everything probably uh, come back to normal there can be left ventricular failure left ventricular yes, hypertrophy yeah, bi -ventricular. ventricular failure in fact ventricular. left and then right also and they these defects generally come become a bit all right after the surgery but valvular heart defects that has happened earlier in life they don't come back right sir. so there can be such things because now you have to understand that after examination to go for investigations so you have to have focus investigations So for focus investigation, you should know how and where the systems are getting compromised by the disease process. That doesn't apply to only acromegaly; they can be a Cushing's disease also. Okay, so you have to understand that where and why the the part of system examination is very important, so that we can do a focused investigation to rule out or to uh, ratify our claim or the particular abnormality. Okay, now see this. Yes, What about abdomen? Can there be any problem in the abdomen? Uh, if there is a syndromic men one and men four, yes. Yes, the patients can have pheochromocytoma. So, uh, in what men. is the percentage of patients having pheor and men one and men four? Any idea percentage of people with acromegaly in uh, 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 men one and men four, or maybe a familial men? It's very Sir, less. I, uh, not aware. Less than two percent. It's very less. But, but they can be. These are from extracranial hyperpituitarism. Can also be a cause of this. Okay, hmm. so can you go ahead, please? Next slide. So yeah, summarize your patient, please, for me. Sir, after history and clinical examination, uh, my thirty-nine-year-old serving soldier has presented with widening of hands and feet since two years, associated with heaviness of head, uh, weight gain, heaviness of voice, and obstructive sleep apnea. On examination, patient is overweight with acromegaly. History and examination are suggestive of a cellar mass, likely pituitary tumor or uh, a craniopharyngeal. So this is okay, my. So patient has got a intracranial tumor. Is the patient having increased uh, and, increased ICP? Uh, with no features of raised ICP, sir. Oh yes, because what are the three parts of a diagnosis? Uh, so the etiology and yes. uh, the pathology. Yes, and uh, the functional. Functional. Uh, so whenever you mention diagnosis, you have to have all these three concepts. When in a patient of cardiac patient, you say that patient not in failure is the last statement, or patient is in failure. Similarly, in patients of neurosurgical, like supratentorial or infratentorial, base of the uh, brainstem lesion, posterior fossa lesion, or even a pituitary, you need to mention patient does not have any features of increased ICP because that makes the surgery. Emergent, urgent, or maybe elective surgery, right? So you have to understand this, that this part of three parts of a diagnosis is very important. And now we know that patient can be having intracranial lesion, being having yeah. some sort of you know secretion from the pituitary that causing a metabolic change and causing such type of things. So with this thing in mind, you know, you need to validate your differential diagnosis with some investigations. So, what type of investigations and why will you go ahead with? Sir, so first of all, I would like to do uh, basic investigations and get a complete hemogram to know the 
uh, baseline hemoglobin of the patient. And uh, I would also like to uh, get the uh, renal function test with the patient done to know my baseline urea and creatinine. Then I would also like to know the patient's uh, sugar profile, sir, blood sugar profile, since there can be uh, metabolic abnormalities uh, in these patients uh, with the hyperglycemia. Then I would like to, also with renal function test, I would like to know the serum electrolytes uh, uh, of this patient. And uh, then I would like to also uh, find out the, uh, uh, do a baseline ECG for the patient and see Very good. the yeah. uh, cardiac status of the patient. Mm. And uh, since these cases do have uh, cardiac complications, uh, then also, this patient has the obstructive sleep apnea. I would like to see the x-ray and look for the airway uh, of the patient. Then, uh, since this patient has uh, cardiovascular complications, then I would like to go for a for cardiography and see the cardiac status of the patient, the valvular abnormalities or any hypertrophies. Uh, other than the basic investigation, I would also like to have uh, specific endocrine investigations to know my uh, status of the functional periodic tumor. So I would like to uh, get um, to confirm the acromegaly. I would like to get the uh, growth hormone levels done, the growth hormone suppression test done. And I would like so I would also like to know the insulin line growth factor one, the levels of the same. Then uh, there can be other associated abnormalities of the pituitary. So I would like to get rule out those as well in the form of thyroid dysfunction. So uh, thyroid profile uh, test and uh, prolactin test, cortisol levels, uh, LHFSH levels, and testosterone levels to rule out the other associated hormonal abnormalities in this patient. This is uh, the tumor aspect. The patient also has obstructive sleep apnea. Yes. And he scored very high on uh, the Epsworth sleepiness scale as well. Uh, so I would also like to uh, get a polysomnography done for the patient. Uh, to see his apnea, hypapnea index. Uh, also, like to uh, see spirometry of the patient. And uh, patient, uh, while this patient is not complaining of any uh, visual abnormality, but we do need to document the visual field study and do a perimetry to see the baseline uh, of the patient. And uh, I am anticipating a difficult airway, so. I would like to do, uh, other than the X-ray, I would like to do an airway ultrasound and see what my airway looks like and is there any narrowing. Or since so there's hostess of the voice, is the vocal cord movement normal? Uh, so I would like to get an ideal also done, in the laryngoscopy done, and have that documented. So I have a, I have a baseline level for the same. Uh, other than these, sir, I, um, I would also like to have radiological investigations done. So. I would like an MRI uh, for a pituitary case. I would like to have an MRI and uh, uh, to see the extent of the MRI, which MRI you would like to have? MRI, MRI yes. of the MRI brain, sir. Uh, see, see MRI brain. And uh, first of all, I would like to see the extent of the tumor and uh, whether, whether it is encroaching upon uh, any important structures and. Uh, also, MRI will uh, give me an idea of the, uh, the, it can also tell me if there's an, uh, the cavernous sinus is involved or not, what is, uh, is it uh, approaching the carotid artery and uh, the contrast uptake and how is the contrast what does, uptake. What does the pituitary look like in MRI? I mean, coronal lens, IIT plane, your T1, T2 images, have you read about it? Because unless you know a normal pituitary, you won't be able to appreciate adenoma or macro microadenoma. So you need. Sir, uh, uh, on MRI, the pituitary looks like a white dot. So what is that white dot? Is it the anterior or posterior? It's the posterior pituitary, which appears as a white dot on the MRI. Why? Why? Why is it? Why is the posterior pituitary look like a white dot? Because of vascularity, sir. I'm just guessing. Something not blood sure. barrier, right? If it's not, uh, 
it's outside the uh, blood brain barrier. So the anti-air sure therapy that. is iso intense in T1 and posterior pituitary is hyper intense hyper in intense. Uh, T1 and hypo intense in T2. T2. Okay, and there is a functional MRI done for pituitary in which you see the gradual uptake of the contrast and it. No, any microadenoma which is normally not visible is shown as a void. So you call it a pituitary void. Sir. Okay. okay. So uh, I think you mentioned all investigations very meticulously. Uh, what I feel that when you talked about ECO, you said that it is optional. I feel the patient is having OSA, patient is having a high, well, like OSA, severe OSA. They can be chances of pulmonary artery hypertension because of chronic retention of carbon dioxide. And patient will might have a lot of uh, issues in the heart when it comes to the gradients. And if you do a echo, you might be able to know this better. So I guess echo will be a very important uh, step uh, for uh, your clarification of a diagnosis in in such a case. So echo is very important. And I I guess you have covered everything right. IDL and ultrasound of the air, uh, of the airway, and uh, of course uh, going through the uh, the MRI. So, uh, do we have the investigations of the patient, uh, your patient? Yes, sir. Okay, so before we go ahead, this is a small question to our audience. Which of the following are, it, are due to endocrine hyposecretion hypo secondary to pituitary disease? Addison's, Graves, diabetes insipidus, or galactoria? You can just type your answers, A, B, C, D. I'm not able to see the chat box, so. Uh, yeah. So, okay, so. A. Everybody is, yeah. So, yes, yeah, Surbi, what is the right answer? So, am I allowed to answer? Yes, please, please answer. Uh, so we can uh, go through the options uh, one by one and see uh, the first option being Addison's disease. Uh, it, it is hyposecretion secondary to pituitary. So Addison's is uh, not a hyposecretion. It's basically adrenocortical insufficiency. Uh, then we cannot have Graves because that is a hypersecretion uh, overactivity. So there's hyperthyroidism. And uh, also... Uh, it cannot be D because galactoria again is uh, uh, hyperprolactinemia causing galactoria. So the answer is uh, diabetes insipidus. Sir. It is yeah, uh, because good. of less reduced ADH. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, next. So these are the investigations so, you are you have you have got. So anything yes, significant in this? No, sir. All the investigations are within normal limits, including a echocardiography of the patient. Okay, so blood, blood sugar is normal. The endocrine profile is normal. Echocardiography is normal. Okay. Can you go to the next slide, please? So these are endocrinological investigations of the patient yeah. in which we can see that uh, insulin like growth factor 1 is markedly elevated and uh, on uh, growth hormone separation test after 100 grams of glucose, there was no reduction in the uh, growth hormone levels. Ideally, it should reduce and should be less than one uh, after we give 100 grams of glucose. But uh, So when you give 100 again, grams of glucose, you test it at generally 0, 30 and 60. Or here they have tested at uh, 0, 60 one and 120 and minutes. Yes. So there is should be reduction of less than one microgram per liter. Sir. Or Okay, so that should be the reduction of the growth hormone because of giving glucose. But yes, has it happened? No, sir. In this case, Not it has happened. remained high. Okay. So only IGF1 uh, is increased, right? Yes, sir. What about cortisol? What and about LH and FSH? Prolactin? Uh, sir, prolactin is uh, uh, testosterone is in normal limit. So was the thyroid profile. And uh, uh, cortisol also. Uh, this was the morning level, so this is also within normal limit, and prolactin also, as well as LHN FSH within normal limit. So this is only for growth hormone. The functional component was only growth hormone, which is deranged. 
Okay, so when you see this profile, can you talk about the little, you know, etiology of a pituitary tumor of acromegaly? Um, sorry, sorry, I didn't catch that. Any the etiological uh, profile of a patient with acromegaly? The epidemiological epidemiology. Epidemiology. Epidemiology profile of a uh, patient of acromegaly. Sir, I'm uh, epidemiological. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, pituitary tumors, uh, they have, they're quite common. They've seen in uh, 15 to 20 percent of patients, sir, present with, yes. of, yes. presenting with intracranial tumors will have pituitary tumors. And uh, they can be microadenomas, they can be macrodenomas. So how did, um, what, is macro, what is micro adenoma? So less than 10 is less than 10 mm size is a micro adenoma and more than 10 is considered as a macro adenoma. And uh, other than the size, uh, it can also be uh, functional or non-functional uh, adenoma. So a functional tumor will be the one which is hormone secreting. Uh, okay. So they usually present early and uh, Non-functional tumors present late once there is mass effect, like you had mentioned, on the ventricle and cranial nerves and uh, visual impairments. Uh, then we can have different types of uh, hormones which can be raised in pituitary tumor like growth hormone or uh, uh, causing acromegaly or we can have adenocorticotropin hormone which will cause uh, Cushing's disease. Then there can be thyroid secreting hormones also, which can present with uh, thyroid dis dysfunction. So most of the patients, they usually present with growth, um, growth hormone uh, dysfunction and they will have raised levels of insulin like growth factor one. Okay, great. So and what timing of, of the one's life, do you see the maximum probability of this disease to come? Acromegaly, when is it diagnosed? At what age? So usually uh, after middle age, after yeah. 40 years, around 40 years. Yeah, 40 to 50 years is the time. And what is the gender ratio? Do ladies have more or gents have more? They need it, gender there's bias? No, there is no gender bias. So it affects both yeah. genders so equally. Generally, both the male and the female gender are both prone to acromegaly or their incidence is the same. And they are diagnosed mostly at the age of 40 to 50. That fits a patient's profile. He's 39, right? So he was Sir. diagnosed pretty early. One more year, he would have had, a, had other problems like a visual deficit. So visual, visual deficit takes place. Which part of the uh, visual visual field is affected? So the uh, optic chiasma is the one which will be affected. So uh, that is where the uh, fibers are getting, nasal fibers are getting crossed. So patient will yes. have bitemporal hemianopia. Okay, great. So the visual loss will be from the bitemporal region. Now you've got this patient, right? So according to her, he's quite elective case, right? Yeah. He can be, he can be uh, listed next week. Absolutely. But tonight, there's sudden loss of vision. Patient is not able to see anything. What do you feel has happened? Uh, sudden onset, sir, patient could have had a blood, he could have an epoplexic Yes. happening which could have caused bleed and sudden yes. compression. So what what all can happen during apoplexy? Is there any metabolic changes that can happen during apoplexy? Uh, sir, they can be a uh, patient can go into uh, diabetes insipidus. Yes. And yeah, they can be uh, conditions of diabetes insipidus. Patient can patient go into shock. Yeah. Yes, a patient can bleed and go into shock. So this is an emergency. Okay, and it has to be addressed immediately. So knowing it can be because of infarction as well as bleeding. It is not always uh, bleeding that can cause apoplexy. And infarction can also take uh, can cause apoplexy. Okay. Now you mentioned the term diabetes and insipidus. What do you think diabetes and is? What is it? So uh, DI is basically um reduced release of ADH uh, from the pituitary, which is causing, uh, which will present with, uh, if the patient is uh, awake, patient will have 
polydipsia excessive water intake then Great. patient will have uh, more urine output increased amount of urine output and uh, patient will also uh, be dehydrated and uh, have uh, raised sodium levels so we call about once you talk about uh, uh, abnormality of sodium first say is hyponatremia or hyponatremia it is hyponatremia right hyponatremia with increased urine output yes sir with reduction in urine osmolality and now everything has got a uh, value to it so hyponatremia is when how much how much of hyponatremia we will call uh, a di patient will present what is the definition of hyponatremia more than uh, sir so more than uh, hyponatremia of more than 140 sir more than 148 what about the urine output a uh, urine output how do you quantify sir, it uh, uh, more than 200 to 300 ml per uh, day per per no no per hour, hour sorry per hour per hour for more per, than 2 hours one day for 2 hours 2.5 ml per kg per hour and per day how much per day how much i do not recall sir yeah it is around you can go to 30 liters also so it is large amount of urine dilute urine because osmolality is also less and it causes hypernatremia so sir this is a, a, a pituitary can present like this in acromegaly sorry in uh, apoplexy so now you got this patient who is got for elective surgery how do you how do you plan for the surgery and any other investigation you like to show uh, sir patient's polysomnography had a Okay. so we have done this have we done this yes sir. yeah next we'll do a little hurry up because it's already 7:30 yeah sir. so this is the investigation yeah, of choice uh, of for the airway which we do pre operatively also nowadays all our residents sir, are doing it and it's a very good thing to do do a ultrasound of the airway and get an idea as to how uh, we are uh, anticipating a difficulty or not okay okay great so this, this is, is the, the mri so what is the mri showing yes, a quick review of the mri sir we Uh, so this is the T2 weighted image on my left and the T1 weighted image on my right, which is a coronal section of the brain, and uh, we can see a heterogeneous uh, T2 hyper intense and T1 uh, iso intense pituitary macrodenoma, which is encasing the uh, cavernous uh, uh, cavernous internal carotid artery, and it is bulging into the cavernous sinus. Okay, so it is not yet and pressing on the optic chiasma, right? No, chiasma sir. Optic chiasma is free. Yeah, great. Next, and sir, this is uh, sagittal section and coronal section again after post contrast. So uh, the extension it is showing the extension of the tumor beyond the cellular floor with homogeneous enhancement, and the right optic chiasm is again normal, and the pituitary stalk is also normal. Okay, yeah. So next, next slide. Okay, so is a question for our audience. Which of the following combinations of endocrine dysfunction and medical management are incorrect? Choice is acromegaly, octreotide, Cushing's disease, ketoconazole, prolactinoma, carbagolin, and thyrotropinoma L. That is levothyronine. Is incorrect. So the audience are encouraged to type the answers in the chat box. I think everybody is getting it right this time. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. So, Surabhi, you have got this patient. Next slide, please. You have got got this patient who is having features of pituitary macrodenoma. What is the size of the tumor? Sir, it is nineteen uh, into twenty three into eighteen mm. Yeah, it is big. Okay, it's big, but it's not pressing on the chiasma, and because it has gone down, right? It has gone down to the carotid, yes, the sinus, and encases the carotid. It is not on up. It is going to infracellular extension, not a supracellular extension, and no yes, features sir. of increased ICP. So you need to go ahead with the surgery, right, for this patient. So what type of surgery will go ahead with, and how many types of surgery can be offered to a patient of pituitary? Sir, uh, we can go by the endoscopic uh, method, Most or we can go by the open, open method exactly. for the surgery. And endoscopic so usually... and last is. Oh, uh, craniectomy, sir. We can go for craniectomy, craniectomy. as well. So, so really usually, surgery preferred. Uh, sir, if the the bone is too thick, they cannot approach nasally. 
and uh, the tumor size is large and very they cannot large. very good very good super cellular basically super cellular growth super cellular mm -hmm. and what you said is very right we have seen patients where the mri says that the the bone is very thick to be you know the we call the cribriform plate and all very thin but at times the bone is so thick that the endoscope cannot burst through it so it pre operatively it is decided to go uh, a craniectomy will be done okay so this patient is going for a uh, trans endoscopic uh, transcranial approach transcranial approach okay so endoscopic surgery can be done over the uh, some other route also but here we are doing transnasal right so transnasal what what do you think should be a pre operative preparation for this patient yeah 1 to 3 4 5 hurry up sir uh, first of all we need to uh, we have to think about his comorbid condition of osa that mm -hmm. he has and uh, we have uh, the uh, surgical approach as well so we have uh, so we have the so airway the, that we have to manage to the, sorry sorry for interrupting you you just go to the patient the night before the surgery and what what pre operative instructions will you give to the patient and to the nursing staff sir pre operatively i will uh, go to the ward examine the patient uh, introduce myself tell him about the procedure uh, check for uh, inform him about his uh, surgery uh, check for his uh, uh, pre op medications and uh, in in this case sir i would not like to give a pre op anxiolytic uh, like alprilax because patient already has osa so i don't want to compromise the airway further and uh, uh, i can give him uh, a pre operative ranitidine uh, h2 receptor blocker and i can also i will also uh, check my venous axis explain to the patient the iv axis will be taken how he will be induced in this case sir because of difficult airway i want to i would like to go for a wake fiber optic so i will explain the procedure of a wake fiber optic so patient uh, is aware of what is going to happen tomorrow and uh, also uh, uh, i would also like to uh, check the consent take consent then inform consent explain the patient regarding the complications of surgery okay so patient would, does uh, require patient has come to the ot right okay you have explained everything to the patient now you have already done the check up of equipment the check up of your drugs what airway instruments would you like to keep for this patient and why so for this patient i would like to keep the difficult airway cart ready so i would like to have uh, intracranial tubes of various sizes and uh, my size smaller as well and then i would like to keep uh, my uh, blade for laryngoscope i would like to keep my coi uh, i would like my video laryngoscope as well uh, then i would like to keep uh, lma uh, uh, for the uh, in in case i cannot ventilate the patient but i would also like to have an intubating lma if available i would like to put that then uh, yes. also so 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 now uh, let's let's assume that this patient's ultrasound is fine his ideal is fine okay so you will like uh, still like to go with a uh, fiber optic or you will like to go with a mccoy and go ahead with your, your procedure of intubation sir i would like to uh, if uh, or the examination has been fine then i would like to go for mccoy because in this case i cannot do uh, nasal intubation i have to do oral intubation so it uh, does become uh, difficult to do oral so fiber either use a mccoy you can you can use a uh, video laryngoscope yeah video video laryngoscope and you like it so now okay so uh, you have given a fentanyl you have given propofol you have done a mask ventilation mask was all right you know just i am not making things more complicated right now and you put a endotracheal tube of 8 mm into diameter you like to go for flexo metallic or a normal tube you can do either and then where do you put the tube which side of the mouth uh, so i would like mouth? so the uh, surgeon depend on the hand of the surgeon the surgeon is right handed then i will fix the Uh, generally, generally the, the right approach side. of the TNTS is from the right side. Yes, sir. So the tube is generally fixed on the left, left angle of the mouth. And then what do you do? What, what do you do after that? You do a. Then I confirm the uh, bilateral air entry. Very good. And ensure uh, tube placement is correct. And uh, I would also like to take a uh, invasive uh, arterial line, sir, to have. Uh, yeah. IBC so, monitoring. so the thing is that you have to ap apply the monitors first, as in soap me yes. protocol. You have the monitors first, and then while doing the intubation, of course, you need to take the intraarterial axis. So where do you like to, uh, where, where, which, which, which artery you like to cannulate? Uh, 
uh, so usually this patient has acromegaly so i am suspecting saputaran syndrome could be you should i would like to let go of the risk and uh, go for the dorsalis pedis instead okay Okay, so the uh, now since we are already into the case, can you tell us what are the what will be your goals of anesthesia for this case and specific monitoring which you like to yeah, including the monitoring and I mean, you generally define your preset goals like uh, your hemodynamics or monitoring. So how do you define your how do you set your intraoperative goals for anesthesia in this case, like? Maintenance of cerebral perfusion pressure. I'm just giving you one of them. So, how do you? Uh... What are the goals of anesthesia? Sir, uh, one of the goals is hemodynamic uh, stability throughout, and maintenance of. I would like to go for a hypotensive. Uh, uh, maintain a hypotensive hemodynamics with a lower systolic for around hundred, and then uh, adequate brain relaxation and. Adequate uh, cerebral perfusion, uh, maintenance of normal ICP, then uh, also uh, that, uh, I would also like to have uh, maintain a if there is visual difficulty then I would like to maintain a higher P PACO2 to ensure visualization of the pituitary by the surgeon, and uh, uh, I would also like to uh, ensure uh, patients. Uh, renal protection i would like i like to ensure that electrolyte stability is maintained so i would like to go for a, a balanced all solution as my uh, iv fluid of choice and uh, uh, and considering uh, your patient is a known patient of osa are there any specific kind of drugs you want to use in this case for awakening or something to do with that uh, sir i, I would like to avoid overuse of opioids Okay. Yes, and uh, maybe take the patient on dexmedetomidine. Very good. Uh, and have a smooth uh, awake extubation instead of a deep extubation because this case is a he's a case of OSA. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, ensuring there is not emergence and uh, any sudden uh, bleed at the surgical site as well. Okay. So, uh, what extra monitor can you put in this patient? Give me a train of four, right? Sir, tough monitoring. What what extra uh, what what extra cerebral monitor can you for? Uh, sir, uh, bis monitoring for depth bis monitoring. Yeah. Okay, very nice. And one more monitoring and has been tried, but not with great luck. That is visual evoke potential. Evoke potentials. Okay. Yeah. So it has been tried, but not very very uh, no significant significantly altered in uh, these patients. So. Uh, now the surgery has started. So you, you mentioned that you need to have a hypotensive anesthesia. Why so? Uh, sir, because the it's there's, there's very close proximity to the cavernous sinus. No, no, that's cavernous sinus is first, far ahead yes. after entering the cranium. It is the bleeding also, that is happening during the nasal approach that might yes, uh, impede the vision of the of the surgeon. So that is sir. primarily the the reason. And then you spoke, just spoke about increased uh, ETC2. That's very important. That is one of those new surgeries where you you tolerate a little amount of hypercapnia, unlike any other new surgery, because you want the cerebral blood flow to increase intraoperatively and the pituitary falls down in the vision. So what else can be done preoperatively to facilitate the view of better view of uh, intraoperative uh, uh, pituitary view? What can be done preoperatively to have a better view of the pituitary? Sir, I have not seen this, but I have heard of uh, putting a lumbar drain. Lumbar drain, and yes. Using saline. Good, good. So once you do neuroanesthesia, DM neuroanesthesia, I'm sure you'll see it. But yes, uh, we uh, we can put uh, a lumbar drain and give infiltrate in sterile condition, normal saline uh, to uh, distill water inside the uh, CSF to get the uh, pituitary vision. Okay. Now we have entered what. Can happen right now? What problems can happen during the surgery? Uh, so, during the surgery, there can be bleed. Yes, uh, one. There can be uh, carotid injury. Yes, there can be damage. Yes. They can be Next. damaged with the content, contents of the cavernous sinus. Yeah, what, what content are you worried about? Is there any content that will 
have a certain impact on the heart rate uh, so the trigeminal uh, nerve is in the cavernous yeah. sinus so compression of that can cause a vagal response and cause bradycardia what do you call it uh, the trigeminal cardiac reflex trigeminal cardiac reflex very nice so the afferent and the efferent the efferent goes to the pons and medulla from that it goes to the heart so it can have a bradycardia and hypotension tachycardia hypotension depends upon whether it is uh which which location yeah so you have to be very very care about careful about and what if it happens what will you do if it happens what will you do you have to inform the surgeon that they stop the surgery yes so intraoperatively what all complications can be there above the trigeminal cardiac reflex of bleeding and then they can very bolism uh, they can very uh, bolism yes, right because of the direct access you can very bolism be very very careful about that and then when the resection is taking place they can be Either DI or it can be SIDH also. Yes, sir. I don't know. Also, so you need to be very very careful about uh, the electrolytes of the patient. That's why you have put an intraoperative, very preoperative uh, arterial Ar line. Arterial line. Arterial line. So increased urine output in a patient of acromegaly. What is the most common cause? Is it DI? Uh, sir, it could be. More higher amount of intraoperative fluid, yes. large volume of fluid resuscitation yes. that has been done. And or what else? And what else? Uh, it could be. It could be DI also. You or it can be diuretics or some. Do you use diuretics? It can be diuresis of acromegaly. The entity known as right. diuresis of acromegaly. In both these conditions, the osmolality won't change. It won't be reduced, right. as in case of DI. Okay. So intraoperatively, patient is there. Now you have the surgery has has taken place. Now what? Now you are given Dexmed. You have stopped Dexmed. You had given fentanyl. You had given atracurium probably, or maybe cis atracurium. And now you want to you want to keep the patient intubated, or you want to extubate the patient? Yeah, uneventful since surgery. The, since there were no intraop complication, my patient's functional status is also. Uh, okay preoperatively there was no other yeah. issues with the patient so i would so like to we, extubate this patient we like to extubate the patient why because a uh, awake patient is a best neuromonitor okay and if there is a complication that has happened that will be easily recognized now before before extubation what all things will you keep in mind uh, so first of all i have to make sure that there is no residual bleeding happening from the nasal cavity and uh, there is no uh, there is no uh, CSF rhinorrhea happening. There is no CSF leak happening prior to extubation. Uh, then I also want to check the uh, pupils of the patient to ensure that yes, very important. No the pupils have to be checked. Awesome. Yeah. Go. Very good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, also, sir, uh, I would like to. Uh, Ensure a smooth extubation to avoid any sudden increase in ICP, which can cause bleeding. Uh, so this patient, since he's also a case of OSA, so uh, that is a challenge that I have to tackle to ensure a vague extubation as well as smooth uh, extubation. So I would like to use some... So, so excellent. What is the absolute contraindication that is there post-extubation? Absolute contraindication. What will not do after extubation? Uh, bag mask ventilation. Yes, you won't uh, give up. Bag mask ventilation. Bag mask ventilation. Why? Because the air can go inside the, the uh, defect brain because the pneumocephalus. Pneumocephalus. Yes, sir. So what can you do to manage the airway in this case? Yes, I mean, can you do something to maintain the potency? Oh, you see, Colonel Ajit, he has got what? He has got OSA. That also severe. And patient will require uh, oxygen support. And you have told the surgeon, ki, boss, this is OSA. Hai. And you cannot just uh, make him put a mask on his face and continue. Okay. You have to give him positive pressure. So what can be done in such a catch twenty situation where you have got a patient with severe OSA and bag mask is contraindicated? What can you do? Then I can ask the surgeon to put in uh, NPA, to put a nasal trumpet yes. under vision. The so that surgeon no will put a nasopharyngeal airway or a nasal trumpet under vision contemplating the fact that this patient will require 
CPAP, nasal CPAP, because this patient was also in nasal CPAP preoperatively. And you doing it, you'll have a lot of negative the issues can be going inside, causing, causing pneumocephalus, causing meningitis and all. Okay. So after you do a gentle laryngoscopy, you take out the throat pack under vision, see whether there is CSF rhinorrhea there or not. Because if it is CSF rhinorrhea, it is important to see. You see the pupils, whether it is anastochoria or not. The nasal trumpet or the NPA has been inserted by the surgeon and uh, intranasal packing has been done. And one thing very important, pre-operatively to tell the patient, Ki, boss, your nose will be closed. Nose will be you have to breathe from your mouth. That is a part of the counseling, right? Now, you reverse the patient till the patient becomes awake and you extubate the patient and maintain the patient on oxygen. Oxygen. Okay. I'll give you a scenario. Now you've mentioned the patient on oxygen. Probably you're giving some amount of positive pressure because he has got an NPA and C2 or he doesn't require it because his NPA is there. Automatically, his OS is also gone because all the obstruction is gone, right? He doesn't require now, when he goes to the post-op room, suddenly he decides and he turns cyanotic. And what do you do? What are you suspecting? You can, can suspect airway obstruction. Okay. What all can you suspect now? Sudden deterioration of the patient in the post-op. Uh, airway obstruction, sir, but we have an NPA in place. Incomplete okay. reversal uh, yes. of uh, then you, a then you, try to, you intubate the patient, right? You intubate the patient there and there. Okay, there was no reverse ticket. What 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 else can happen? What else can be a reason of sudden decomposition in immediate post op? It can be a pneumocephalus sir, developing. They can be bleed. They can be bleed. Number one, they can be bleed. They can be pneumocephalus. Yes, like a tension pneumocephalus. More, almost all patients of such surgeries land up in some amount of pneumocephalus and they get absorbed, <laughs> right? And most of the neurosurgical OTs does not have air in periphery. They they use nitrous, right? Yes, sir. This is nitrous. Now you have to take this patient back for CT. CT may pata chal pneumocephalus and he goes to surgery. So what are the problems do you anticipate? You cannot use nitrous right now. It's, because if you use nitrous, yes, the pneumocephalus will expand. And in fact, yes, you cannot use nitrous for at least three weeks. That's for all uh, surgeries under closed space, even, even the eye and the brain. Okay. Okay, now go to the next slide. So, anesthetic implications of acromegaly include all except. Can anyone answer? I hope people are all awake by now. Yeah. I think all are answering right. It is reacting airway disease, and reacting airway disease is not an entity of acromegaly. Okay, next question, Surudi. Anesthetic implication of Cushion's disease include all except. Systemic hypertension, obstetric sleep apnea, glucose intolerance, and increased sensitivity to succinylcholine. Oh, wow. Yeah. There can be some disparity <coughs> regarding the receptors in Cushing's disease because of the upregulation or downregulation because of steroid excess, but it does not have any connotation or any. Uh, you know, evidence of increased sensitivity to succinate choline. Well, well answered, everyone. Cushing's disease is a separate entity, which is at times more risky and more difficult to tackle as far as airway and everything is concerned rather than more than acromegaly. And we should also know what is Cushing's disease and what is Cushing's syndrome. Because at times when it comes to your theory exam, there will be a question about anesthetic management of patients with Cushing's syndrome. And that, that, that you should know what is Cushing's disease and what is Cushing's syndrome. Okay, next question, please. Next uh, next slide. Okay, which of the following statements about the use of lumbar intrathecal catheter during transferoidal pituitary surgery is false? Can be used to assist visualization of tumor by injecting air? Injection of saline through the catheter can aid to push the tumor into the surgical field B. Can we use post-operative to reduce inadvertent CS of rhinorrhea C? And can we use to administer antibiotics for post-operative meningitis D? So, I think it's wrong. Please, please just see the question. It's false. Transferable pituitary surgery is false. Yeah, Sulpi, can you just answer? 
sir d is the wrong answer sir we do not yeah. administer antibiotics this is actually a source of infection so we do not want to use this to okay. administer any great great next oh what is this anyone this is a ct scan post operatively i just mentioned a situation when the patient just decompensated when he went to the uh, when he went to the post op room and he was taken yeah it's pneumocephalus mount fiji sign excellent somebody has said mount fiji sign this is a very typical mount fiji sign that is a part of uh, tension pneumocephalus and the treatment is immediate decompression by doing multiple boreholes or single borehole and taking out the air and patient will get get revived so mount fiji sign it is okay next yeah this is mount fiji which which, which part of the world is mount fiji it's in japan okay next so i think we have gone through uh, certain questions in the course of our discussion that is epidemiological features of pituitary tumors pre op evaluation concerns what has the surgery been performed goals of induction maintenance of anesthesia alternate approaches to case of okay what is this hoarseness hoarseness of voice what is it alternate approach in case of hoarseness of voice what can we do so we can go for uh we can first document uh, if there is a, a rectal laryngeal nerve injury and we can go for yeah. uh, awake fiber optic and then post operatively we yes. preventing more damage to the vocal cord by doing a laryngoscopy intraoperative monitoring of vascular access in this case we have done vascular access to iv cannula is good enough advantage and benefit of a lumbar drain perioperative steroid supplementation yes surbi what about perioperative steroid supplementation uh we usually um so we can give uh, uh they can have uh deregulation of the yes. hp axis yes so in that case they will have to be uh, supplemented yeah. with steroid yeah so generally you do supplement steroid maybe 100 mg of uh, Uh, corticosteroid or you know hydrocortisone over the period of the entire surgery that will prevent the hp access separation and uh, okay. you see pituitary surgery is a very well, quite a painless surgery so you don't have to go very high on opiates also and pituitary gland touching it will cause intense analgesia here okay so patient will be pain free and patient as it is will pain is one of the things that you know patients do wake up early little early but be very careful about that also and then of course uh, the role of steroids is very important so likely explanation of reduced urine output after animal surgery please do not reduce increased urine output please increase urine output so yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> that is di next, okay next time, next likely cause of surgical bleed we have said and consideration for extubation and post operative care so you spoken about that also okay uh next so yeah, is this is a very important question question number 13 is difference between di sidh and cerebral salt wasting syndrome can uh, can you talk about it sir or are you very tired already <laughs> no sir so you already got good marks now you're going for a distinction right okay. uh sir so di is uh, simply explain it is basically increased urine output A yeah. volume contracted state and hypernatremia, yes. what we see uh, yes. because of reduced uh, ADH release from the pituitary. So, whereas SIADH is a syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, so there is continued uh, ADH release even though a patient will have hyponatremia, patient will have hypervolemia, but there is yeah. still uh, uh, ADH release happening. So, these patients will have hyponatremia. Uh, So basically, uh, DI is hypernatremia. Yeah, DI is hypernatremia, hypernatremia. SIDH and CSWS are hyponatremia. Hypo. So now it is clear. Hyper means DI. Hypo means SIDH yes, and CSWS. Now between SIDH and CSWS, how do you distinguish? So CSWS is common. Is it is is a known entity in pituitary tumor as well as post traumatic. So between SIDH and CSWS, how do you differentiate? 
uh, sir, our CSWS is happening because there is increased level of ANP, BNP. So they are suppressing the aldosterone uh, synthesis. So there is uh, natriuresis, there is diuresis happening. Uh, yeah. There will be hyponatremia from increased renal excretion of sodium. Yes, excellent, excellent. And in SID, so, it is volume expansion causing yes, dilutional hyponatremia. Hyponatremia. SIDH is the increased hypervolumic state. Why CSWS is a volume contracted state? Hypovolumic Hypo state. Hypo okay. SIDH, the CVP might be high, while in CSWS, CS, the CV is low. The treatment of CSWS is giving fluid, fluid, while SIDH is restricting fluid. Simple. So, whenever a patient with hypernatremia comes, there is DI. Mm -hmm. DI can be of three levels. We we'll, won't talk of it phases right now. Of, there are three phases, yeah, but we are not going into details yeah. of phases of DI. But how do you treat DI? Uh, sir, we have to uh, correct the sodium levels. So we give uh, D5, we give free water or we can give N by 2 saline. Uh, and we have to, this is a dehydrated state, so we have to supplement fluids. Uh, then uh, we can have uh, specific drugs which we can give for DI, uh, like desmopressin. So there's no pressing. Oh, Sorry, sir. Which all routes can the desmo pressing be given? You have seen. Uh, sir. Yes, sir. I have seen uh, nasal routes. It can be given orally oh, yeah, or as nasal yeah. spray. Yeah. So it can be given subcutaneously also, IV also, intramuscular also. So normally it is given uh, by intranasal spray, which we give normally. Good. Okay. Just before we ending this. Can you talk about uh, airway classification, very typical, very typical of uh, acromegaly, which was historically described and it has been adopted in recent times also. A different airway classification other than malampati classification or Cormac Liane. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of that, sir. It's, uh, it's I, I'll help you out. It's South. Uh, uh, Southwick and Karts classification. Southwick, Southwick, yes, sir. Southwick and Karts classification. So I'll I'll expect our audience to read about Southwick and Karts classification and how how it is adapted to the uh, recent times. Also, it's a very old classification, right? So, but uh, how is it? It is like as old as nineteen seventy nine, but now it's still been adapted as to the 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 which airway device to be used where and why. So please go through the South. South African cards classification, I think everybody will be benefited by it. Okay. So, uh, Kalajit, anything else? Though? I think we have, uh, so we has covered everything else and we had a very nice discussion. So, please, anything from the audience side? Yes, sir, we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, first is, will you do ABG pre-op in these patients with acromegaly? Yes, I think we'll like to do an ABG pre-operatively. Uh, the pre-operative AVG can be a part of the PA, uh, the pre-operative checkup also. But uh, once we put the arterial line, uh, uh, just before the surgery, we will like to do uh, AVG there also and uh, use it as a baseline AVG. Yeah, to get the electrolyte level, sodium, what is the sodium also? And sir, second question is, what all monitors are specific for this case? I think we have uh, spoken about it. We have can have a cerebral monitor, we can have a depth of anesthesia monitor, like a BIS monitor or entropy, and also visual if, uh, evoked potential monitor can be used in pituitary surgeries, which has been used historically, but uh, uh, it has not been of much success. And of course, the uh, ribbon monitoring, including uh, invasive blood pressure, can be used. And monitoring the third, of the. Yeah. yeah of, the third the question is that uh, yeah. does the awake fiber optic will cause the hemodynamic instability in these patients because we prefer smooth induction and extubation? So, for the smooth induction, does the awake fiber optic is required in these patients? Awake fiber optic is uh, done properly, will not cause much hemodynamic disturbances. With a good preparation of the patient, the only thing that is having a problem in practical problem in fiber optic is a oral fiber optic. In this case, we are doing oral fiber optic. Okay, so if anyone has done oral fiber optic, you will realize to me with me. You'll, you'll, you understand that with a normal tongue, it is very easy, difficult to displace the tongue from the root of the fiber optic channel where you're putting the fiber optic inside. 
while in when you are nasal fiber optic it is very easy to follow the track of the posterior pharynx and go inside the glottis so in a acromegaly patient with a larger tongue it is a difficult proposition but with adequate help the helper in this patient is very important in oral fiber optic fiber optic the person is helping for intubation is a very very important person and he should be knowing what to do when to thrust the jaw at times pull the tongue out and it has become a chill lift is required at times pulling out the tongue is required and it is such a big tongue and acromegaly and so, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so now coming on to that specific question so always remember that in any case the airway always takes precedence we are worried about the airway here. We are not worried maybe patient is coughing or something like that. It's slight increase in ICP. But in all such scenarios, you, you can't have a loss of airway. You can't give a... I mean, so always go in for a fiber optic if you are facing a difficult airway. So even okay. Southwick and CARDS classification has mentioned the similar thing. They have gone for trichostomy actually. That those times, fiber optic was not there. So they have spoken about trichostomy in case of a difficult airway or preoperative trichostomy. Okay, so next question is, any blocks are needed to reduce the opioid requirement in these patients, such as the infraorbital or the sphenopalatine block? They can be given. The requirement, as I just told you, the uh, pituitary surgery as such is not a very painful surgery. So, uh, it will, as soon as the pituitary is touched, it causes intense analgesia. here. And you ask any patient post-operative about the VASCO, they will be very comfortable with the lower dose of opioids they have reached, and you can supplement with NSAIDs. So it can be given, but I have not given it, neither I will advocate in giving it because it's not a very, very painful surgery. Yes, other surgeries that involve the oromaxillofacial area can be supplemented and I we do regularly give facial nerve blocks in all the segments. Okay. So next question is, can we use Bailey's maneuver for smooth uh, extubation as we expect tissue thickening in these acromegalic patients? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it, it's, a, it's an excellent maneuver in which you actually put a supraglottic airway device and then after the patient becomes smooth because you cannot do back and mass ventilation. So Bailey's maneuver is a routinely pract uh, practiced area and I thank you for, for the person who has asked this question. We missed on that. But it is should be kept in mind in every patient where a uh, bag and mask is, uh, uh, is, is to be avoided. In fact, at times when there is a pre-oxygenation failure because of not giving an adequate amount of bag and mass and there's a lot of leak. You can also put a IGEL, pre-oxygenate, then take it out and then oxygenate, uh, put, put the tube inside. So Billy's maneuver absolutely is indicated in, in, in such patients. Okay. And the last question is the portal circulation in pituitary cases. Yeah. Yeah. They're asking about the portal circulation. Yes. So we need to do physiology about, we can read about physiology and this is not the adequate right forum because if you start talking about portal circulation, it will take a lot of time. But definitely you should go through it because it does make you understand what is the anterior-posterior shift and how, how do you manage it at times. Okay, sir. These are the questions, sir. We are now we can end up with the session. <clears throat> Survi, can I ask one question to you? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh Two, two parts actually. The first part is whether you will be comfortable with the single nasal airway or the bilateral nasal airway. Nasopharyngeal airway. Uh, so I'll be comfortable with the single nasopharyngeal airway because I just want the airway to open uh, and not collapse on itself. So See, with the patient of OSA and acromegaly, uh, suppose the single nasopharyngeal airway, there are chances, suppose there's secretion, something like anything, because you have done a surgery here, nasal bleeding can, you know, uh, it can trickle down. The blockage of one airway chances are higher in these patients. It's always preferable because the surgeon or a patient is okay, but the surgery is such, when you are approaching the pituitary, you are getting access through both the nostrils sometimes. And the, both the nostrils, you know, they get traumatic and uh, trickling can be from any side. And the packing is sometimes more discomforting rather than the nasopharyngeal airway bilaterally. Now comes the second part. Now you are going to remove the throat pack. So what is the time of removal of throat pack if you want to see the CSF rhinorrhea? Whether you want to put the nasal pharyngeal airway first or you want to remove the throat pack first? So first have the NPNC2. 
if you put a, a see if you put the nasopharyngeal airway bilaterally or even a unilaterally packing on other side there are chances that the csf renoria may be missed when you take out the throat pack because sometime it's the pressure is low yeah. so that's why the later on what happens when you take out the, the throat pack after some time you will start having that csf renoria then you i think it's very difficult to take the patient back to the table and do the redo the procedure so these are two dilemmas when you put so what we can do here is a very simple procedure put a bilateral nasal airway we have done it we have done it and we have feel it very successful you can always uh, the, in the post operative room paku you can always see for a renoria csf renoria or for the bleeding because the airway sometimes what happens it after some time it take the shape of that uh, the entire tissues around it it acts as a tamponade and stop the bleeding as well as renoria also so that is a very very simple step to follow and you can always see the bleeding is happening or not post surgically so this is a very simple bilateral i think if you go through uh, we have already published a paper regarding this thing with a bilateral fess also even to for the post operative bleeding if you want to see it's always easy to gauge with the bilateral placement of nasal airway and the patient feels very comfortable the packing what happens the packing now you do the effect of analgesia when been off it cause gives a very discomforting fit, uh, feeling yes, to the patient yes. but not not yes. the nasal pharyngeal airway this is my uh, i think what we used to practice in our setup but maybe i think dr shamik paul and dr ajit bajwa they can throw some more light on these type of uh, no so you are you are perfectly perfectly uh, uh, whatever you said is perfectly right and uh, uh, i think uh, frankly speaking i also in my career of neurosurgery uh, neural anesthesia i have three or four times been seeing that uh, you know uh, bilateral np being placed but yes whatever you said sir is perfectly perfectly right and we practice the same thing nowadays also great thank you same to you and a good safe practice of anesthesia so we you already uh, i think without the even the concurrence of the external dr shamik and dr ajit have already given you that uh, distinction marks i think you know <laughs> so anyway i i think the rest of the people are also the dr madri wanted to ask something she was ready with her question yeah. yeah yeah excellent excellent presentation uh, surbhi and uh, paul sir and uh, Uh, this um, surbhi just a bit out of your case like um, a bit away uh, suppose this patient of yours this giant no whatever acromegaly you can imagine kumbhakarna he is said to be a case of hypothalamic obesity or maybe gulliver if he comes with a fracture if he comes with a fracture of the upper limb what will be your um, uh, what will be your problems in anesthetic management just think so acromegaly so patient coming for coming. the tumor <laughs> yeah. yeah so an acromegaly patient coming for a non neuro surgery yes uh, ma'am uh, general anesthesia of course there is a problem of the osa uh, existing yes. osa that we have yes uh, <clears throat> then uh, these patients so uh, other than that these patients will also have some cardiovascular abnormalities yes so the cardiac issues also will be existing and uh, they will have uh, metabolic derangements uh, they can have hyperglycemia which has to be managed and uh, so what uh, is your plan like you are planning to give general anesthesia or what like it's a fracture of the low, upper limb so uh, prefer to give uh, regional anesthesia what will be the Is problems the of regional for... anesthesia in this case uh, ma'am there will be thick skin uh, okay. thick skin uh, okay. thick soft tissue yeah. these patients can have uh, myopathies also yeah uh, then they can have nerve entrapments because of the uh, yes yes and they can even have sensory neuropathies because very often they are they have diabetes so yeah. they can have sensory neuropathies also so all this has to be documented right yeah. okay and um, what are the changes which occur in the lungs in a case of acro uh, acromegaly uh like in the upper airway we have uh, uh, this uh, mucosal softly. thickening and all yeah ma'am they can have uh, 
uh, ventilatory dysfunction they can have they can have uh, they are known to have uh, something called as pneumomegaly where the even there is said to be an increase in the number of alveoli that's what what yeah. i have read and there can be ventilation perfusion mismatch because of because of that and then of course the thyroid can be enlarged very often right and that yeah. can lead to tracheal uh, compression okay. yeah your patient had hoarseness of voice right my patient had ma'am heaviness of voice and we differentiated it from hoarseness acha it was just heaviness of voice and uh, yeah. i would like to add that preoperatively whether you can uh, decongest the nose by uh, putting some xylometazole in drops before the intubation because it will be hypertrophic no the nasal yeah. yes sir i think you can add that and uh, regarding the nasal intubation often the nasal turbinates are also hypertrophied yes so again that can cause a problem in passing the tube or the airway or whatever yeah thank you if you did the oral intubation and one more thing is that the surgeons need to tend to put a pack full of adrenaline inside the nose and then off goes your hypotensive anesthesia and they are not ready to consider it they said no nothing happens yes. but that adrenaline absorption can also be a reason for sudden increase in blood pressure so uh, i think that will be very with beta blockers yeah yes yeah. so that will be i think what we practice uh, before beta blockers were used before esmolol and other beta blockers the role of dexamethasone i think when we did a yes. research or studies on that thing it was a wonderful drug wonderful drug yes. and it basically obviated any rise in the you know the sudden rise of the blood pressure or the tachycardia when you i think giving the bolus initially and then over 10 minutes 50 microgram over 10 minutes or 1 microgram per kg over 10 minutes and then you start with infusion we did not see much rise in the blood pressure and the tachycardia even when the surgeon was using you know 1 in 2 lakh or the, this one dilution of that 1 in 3 lakh also 1 in 3 lakh was commonly used so we arrived at a particular compromising level where we did not have a you know tachycardia because of that absorption of the adrenaline from the nasal uh, this one capillaries so i think it's a good drug rather than the beta blocker because even the beta blocker you are going to use if the airways are compromised then again you know the that spasm part uh, is very difficult to the reverse the those things so dexmedino has provided us a very good alternative in these type of cases so dr rahul brigadier rahul wanted to uh, brigadier rahul actually yeah, yeah. in a season critical care yeah yeah no uh, i was see. waiting for dr rahul to Sir, speak rahul something season. thank you thank you dr bajwa and uh, well then actually it's a matter of great pride because apart from being the prof and hod surbi happens to be my student i am her guide so actually i am really proud that she has done a excellent exemplary presentation and uh, just just to put uh, for, uh, some light on what uh, dr bajwa sir has said regarding the two nasopharyngeal airways i had uh, seen this being done i had done this in while i was doing my dm at aims but gradually actually it depends on the surgeon most of the times in arm forces in army hospital rr while i was practicing the surgeons were not in favor here in fmc also surgeons actually they want to pack rather than put a nasopharyngeal airway but i fully agree that a nasopharyngeal airway would be a much more physiological option bilateral npa rather than packing but sadly actually we have to go by what the surgeon does and in nowadays many times in many centers is the ent the maxillofacial ent surgeon who makes the way in the tnts so they also come into the picture but if we can convince the the neurosurgical colleagues to go for bilateral npa that would any way be better than nasal packing because the same effect would be achieved by causing less discomfort to the patient yeah definitely and uh, best part for our setup was that i had a good relation with them to involve them into the research that you you do the surgical part so you will be involved in the research activity also so they definitely agree to those things and it was published later on 
So, but we have got excellent results with the bilateral nasal airway. If you go the for the post-operative rounds, the patient with I, I think the even if you remove the biases, uh, the age factor, gender factor, but still we saw that the bilateral nasal airway were practiced and uh, they were tolerated much better and the. Rate of complication, we saw rate of complications also was there with the post-operative bleeding. And, you know, you can always go for a timely control of those bleeding. These are the small oozes, not the bigger one, because the surgeons who were confident of putting bilateral nasal airway, they were good in the surgical, their hands were also good. So though those oozing, was, it was a good signal. In the first 24 hours, these are always crucial. So we could manage those cases very, very comfortably, even in the wards also, sir. Because of that, Doctor Madhuri has raised hands. No, 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 no. I know what. Guilty, sir. No. Uh, let's see, uh, Kritika, you can invite other people also from the seniors. Are very senior people are also there. Other people they can ask the question directly by inviting themselves. Yes, sir. I think this is a very good topic. Uh, Dr. Shamik and Dr. Ajit, they have done a wonderful job. And see, the way Surbi was answering, it was not uh, visible that she was prepared to answer everything. And she was natural. The way the PG students in their final years answer naturally in the examination. That was a very good way. But her confidence never, you know, left her. She was full of confidence in every answer. That was very good uh, teaching, very good preparation by Surbi also. Everybody can unmute themselves. Uh, they can ask questions by raising their hands. Sometimes I think uh, the lecture is so good that no answer, question is left which remain unanswered. And that may be the one reason. Okay, yes, Surbhi, let, me ask, but, uh, let, let me ask Surbhi one question. Surbhi, uh, how many cases you have entered, uh, handled independently the pituitary surgeries, independently, as a third-year resident? Uh, as a third-year resident, I haven't had a chance. But as a second-year then I have seen one pituitary surgery. So how many surgeries you have now? seen? How many surgeries have you seen of pituitary surgeries? One, sir. One, I've sir. Seen one, okay. and then I've seen another. I've seen two in the post-op period in the ICU. Okay. So, uh, what was the most common, you know, difficulty you encountered during this? Now, coming to the that important part, what is the most common difficulty you encountered during these cases? Forget about the theoretical part which you discussed. The most common. Ensuring smooth extubation, sir, because invariably there is uh, some amount of uh, hypertension, tachycardia, and some. Making sure patient doesn't cuff. That was the most difficult part, sir. Yeah, that's a challenging. There comes the role of the clinician who handles the drugs, They're very titrating them in a very good manner. Dr. Shamik told about the wake patient is the best monitor when you are extubating a patient. Awake is the best monitor, but awake itself has also got some uh, drawbacks also, where they, even the rise of minor riders of the intracranial pressures and other bleeding episodes. But... In a wake patient, you always have the advantages. You can encounter the complications then and there on the table only. It becomes easy to handle rather than having, a, you know, the complication in the PACU or in the ward. So it's always better to, if possible, if possible, the first priority is always to have a, a wake intubation. You may feel little discomfort because the smooth extubation is not achieved. It will come with time. And I think you spend the time in anesthesia after seven or eight years. You will be able to handle these patients and whenever you're going to extubate these patients, you will know how to make them more smooth. And although it depends upon patient to patient, their thresholds, their, you know, the this one comfort level with endotracheal tube or nasotracheal tube or whatever we are using, it also depends upon that. But it, with time, you will come to know how to make them a good, safe extubation. Good. You are, you are wonderful in about this thing. So uh, I think uh, there is a time to felicitate our esteemed faculty. I think all we being, uh, you know, showered a blessing by Dr. Rahul Jada, we being HOD, he, he put forward rather than himself, he forwarded two uh, commanders of his, Dr. Ajit and Dr. Shamik, and with their soldier, Dr. Surbi, the major Dr. Surbi. So it's a time to 
felicitated the our faculties and uh, moderators also is my screen visible to everyone yes sir yes sir. yeah so uh, dr ajit badwa sir thank you very much for uh, being a renowned faculty in this class it was a good topic interesting topic and uh, yourself and dr shamik i'm really thankful to both of you so you uh, done a wonderful job and and uh, i think the discussion part was uh, already given the compliments by dr rahul yadav sir so i think uh, nothing to be said more from my part already yes, i am echoing his word only so thank you both of you very much then uh, surbi as already told you the distinction has already been given by the internal and external are conquering this thing they are, they are agreeing with the internal so you deserve that uh, distinction thank you dr anupama i think the debut dr anupama and dr kritika mittal on debut so we thank you both of you and you did also a wonderful job in handling this uh, class as a screen coordinator so we appreciate your efforts and i we will be you know connected for the future webinars and classes also thank you sir and uh, most importantly thank you to dr madhuri and dr nishant for coordinating this class because a lot of effort goes in planning executing implementing and uh, designing the things it's not that easy uh, we indians are in a habit of practicing everything before we go to the stage for our acts so that was done by always done every week timely again and again by dr madhuri and dr nishant preparing the our screen coordinators as well as the pg students so thank you to both of them so exactly. nishant was with us till yesterday he was at afmc for the dnb exam he left yeah. uh, from pune yesterday only he must have reach patna by late afternoon or evening yes sir it was uh, very fortunate to have visited the great institute and great people like you it was a uh, honor is... right to host you dr ishant <laughs> uh, this is a, this is the beauty of these classes they are prepared and... in a very well mannered and executed well mannered and i think now after this class it will be available on youtube and it will be very helpful for the upcoming uh, examination for all the third year pg students and even for not for third year students even for any everyone who want to see how dr shamik and dr ajit coordinated these efforts so that can be always you can you can get all your answers from these classes sometimes rather than going through the books one hour you listen you get all the answers and so then i would thank on behalf of my director and commandant and uh, the dean the our parent society isa for giving us this opportunity to uh, share the knowledge with the colleagues and the residents for which it is meant it's a very novel endeavor it's picking up quite to fast it is picked up quite well and wishing it all the more success in coming weeks thank you sir thank you sir thank you on behalf of our our isa national team and we were privileged to have you people here today and afmc name it's itself a brand you know the academic brand the name afmc yes. right from your right from choosing the mbbs career the special examination for pmcc many people try to go, get you know access to that then post graduation also so it's a brand and the people from afmc coming and uh, giving a class itself is a privilege for uh, and honor for us also as i is a national team also well, thank you very much for that sir and your team so uh, i think we is a time to say goodbye so we always leave the class by saying long live isa and jai hind long live isa jai hind